Where is Ray Gricar? Ray Gricar was known as a tough but fair prosecutor. He announced in 2005 he would not run for re-election. That same year, he vanished without a trace. He told his girlfriend that he was going antiquing and he was never seen again. Sheriff Denny now came in and handed me a note that said Ray Gricar is messy. And I looked up at him and he said, I'm not kidding. One of America's most intriguing mysteries. The last known pictures of him alive on his way to the office the evening before he disappeared. There were clues, all right. Real puzzlers. A strong odor of tobacco in the car. Ray was not a smoker, and he definitely would never let anybody smoke in his car. The investigation into Ray Gricar's disappearance was about to take a whole new turn. The court documents showed he declined to prosecute Jerry Sandusky. Did Gricar leave clues behind? On his desk at the courthouse, a county code book left open to the page of what happens when a DA can no longer serve. Was that a reference to what we would find out years later? Foul play was only one possibility. Everyone has their theories. My secretary has a theory. I'm sure you have a theory. Could this man, this elected district attorney, still be alive? Today I want to talk about what happened to Ray Gricard. I, I don't know why this case is effed me up, okay? It's so disturbing because all the potential options of what happened, like, I don't know which one is worse. And the more information that comes out, the more questions you have. And then there are so many conspiracy theories in this case. It's, it's, I just really want to know what you guys think on this one. So I'm going to do what I usually do on my channel, which is I'm going to give you guys the facts and then we'll discuss the theories. Okay tinfoil hat time, and then you can decide for yourself. So the whole thing started on April 15th, 2005, when Ray Gricar, he was the district attorney of Center County, Pennsylvania. He called his girlfriend, Patty, and he called her at around 11.30 a.m. Ray and Patty lived together, and when Ray called her, he was like, listen, I'm not going to be home at my regular time to feed the dog, so you feed the dog, I'll be home later. He's like, I'm basically going to drive. He used to like to go on these long drives to kind of clear his head and stuff like that. He also really liked antiquing, and there was this antique shop in Lewisburg that he went to before. And so he basically told her, like, I'm going to drive on the freeway and it's towards uh, Lewisburg, the town that had the store. So she's like, OK, fine. And everything seemed fine until it wasn't. I said fine instead of fine. And then by 1130 p.m., like 12 hours after the phone call, she still hadn't heard from him. He didn't come home. He wasn't answering his phone. She freaked out. So she calls the cops and she tells them, like, Ray's missing. At first cops thought that he was actually with another woman because he had a reputation for being a ladies man. He was like known for being very private and you know, he got along well with the ladies. So they were like, Ooh, you know, maybe he's just like with another woman. Well, the next day cops found Ray's car and it was in Lewisburg. It was actually parked out front of the antique shop that he liked to go to. It was called street of shops. By the way, Lewisburg is about 45 miles from where he lives, which is uh, called Belafonte. When they found Ray's Mini Cooper, it was locked. His cell phone was inside and it was turned off. There was also a water bottle in the vehicle and they ended up testing the water bottle for DNA and it had, <clears throat> voice crack, Ray's DNA on it. But there was nothing else in the car. His keys, were gone. His wallet was gone. He was gone. When they processed the vehicle, they first, they said that there was an obvious smell of cigarette smoke. When they look further, they notice that there is cigarette ash on the passenger's side floor mat. The thing is, Ray hated cigarettes. And not only did he hate cigarettes, he hated the smell of the smoke and he would never let anyone smoke in his car. Based on that alone, officers started thinking, well, either someone was in his car smoking, like in the passenger seat smoking, or he had the window down on the passenger side. Someone was standing outside sort of leaning in the window and they had a cigarette and then that's how the ash like fell 
and landed on the passenger side floor. Investigators found cigarette butts on the ground and sent them off for DNA testing. Nothing there. The police end up bringing a sniffer dog to the area and the dog stopped where Ray's car was found. And Bloodhounds lost his scent from the car. If the scent ends outside his car, obviously you have another vehicle involved in all this, which means there is somebody out there that knows something. They also didn't see any evidence of foul play, like there was no blood anywhere, there was no signs of a struggle, any kind of things that were upset and moved around the way they shouldn't be. It didn't seem like anything like that had happened. No email activity. Nothing was used in terms of credit cards. Um, his bank account was not accessed. None of that has been accessed since he went missing. And then his laptop, it was the county issued laptop. So his work laptop was missing from the home. But the weird thing about that is he did not take the case or the charger. Those were still at the home for the laptop. And also um, his friends and family and coworkers and stuff, they all said that he wouldn't usually take his work laptop with him on like a personal trip. When they looked around the home, they noticed that he didn't take anything that would indicate that he was planning to go for a long time, like personal things, clothes, luggage, all of that was still at the home. He just had his sunglasses, his wallet, his keys, his cell phone, presumably the laptop that's missing. And then when they found the car, the only thing that was left was the cell phone. The story starts to get on the news that this district attorney is missing and they found the car and da, da, da. And people start coming forward and saying that they saw him in Lewisburg the day he went missing. They saw him outside of his car pacing like he was waiting for someone and then he got back in his car and sat down. And then another person said they saw him in the car and he was rubbing his face and talking on the phone. There were witnesses that saw him in that antique store where his car was found right in front of that place. They said that he was there, he seemed fine, and then they said that he sort of crossed paths with this woman and he started talking to her and it seemed like they said not romantic but that they knew each other and from somewhere else and that they sort of ran into each other. And this woman was described as tall with dark hair. A lot of people were suggesting that they knew who this woman was, who they said she fit the description of a local TV reporter uh, who frequented that store, was friends with Ray, had seen him like a few weeks before and was a smoker and she was tall and had dark hair. And so it made sense that she would be there and they would run into each other. But according to police, they, they kind of checked up on it and she was out of town and so they didn't think it matched and that sort of went nowhere. Making things a little bit more complicated was the fact that it was then revealed that there were actually several men in Lewisburg who had read Mini Coopers who were there out and about that day and kind of looked like Ray. And so now people were like, was he really in all those places that he was seen or not? So basically all they really knew was that he probably was in the antique store because his car was found outside of there. As for the other sightings, we're not so sure. But the last thing they know for sure was that he parked his car at around 5 p.m. the day he vanished in front of that antique store. Other than that, they didn't know anything. A few months later, there was a huge development in the case. The laptop, remember, that they couldn't find? Well, they found it. And this would make it even more confusing. First of all, the laptop was not far away from where the car was at all. So the laptop was actually found by fishermen and it was like badly damaged with water. Where that antique store is, there's like a bridge, freeway, and then there's also a river. And the laptop was found under this bridge where the river was, very close to where the car was parked, like a four minute walk. And it was actually under the Route 45 bridge. The laptop was quote, lodged against bridge support. The laptop was water damaged and it looked like it had been there for a while. So they said that it was probably like thrown into the river at around the time that Bray went missing. But the weird thing here, I burped, is that 
the hard drive was removed from the laptop. And they said that it was clear that it had been intentionally removed and that it had been removed before it was thrown into the river. Why, why is the hard drive removed? Like, did he remove it and throw it? Did someone make him remove it and throw it? Uh, it, was, it was crazy. Just two months after the laptop was found, the hard drive was found, the one that was removed. And that wasn't far away either. It was by that same river uh, on the river bank. And it was so damaged and it quote, intentionally damaged to the point where they could not get any information from this hard drive. What the hell is on that hard drive? I would die to know. Okay, I don't wanna die, but I really wanna know. As if it wasn't weird enough, police find some very interesting search history. Not on the laptop, obviously, because the hard drive's wiped out, but on the home desktop computer that is in Ray's home that he and his girlfriend, Patty, used. Someone had searched water damage to a notebook computer. What does water damage do to hard drive? How to fry a hard drive? How to wreck a hard drive? This video is sponsored by Factor. Now, Factor is a company that delivers fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved meals right to your doorstep. And they're actually under the same brand as Every Plate, which you guys know I work with a lot, and HelloFresh. I got this jalapeno cheddar chicken breast and then it came with this crema cauliflower rice. You guys, it was so good. You don't have to cook, you don't have to chop anything, nothing like that. You just literally pop it into the microwave for two minutes and you're ready to eat. They have keto options, low calorie options, vegan options, vegetarian options. I love it because it's quick, it's easy, but it's also guilt-free. If you're interested, head to factor75.com or you can click the link below and use my code NOR50. It's going to get you 50% off your first factor box. Click the link below to use my code NOR50 to get you 50% off your first factor box. Thank you to Factor for supporting my channel and thank you guys for watching. Back to the video. It was also revealed that Ray had purchased software to wipe a hard drive and that Patty knew that he had purchased this and was trying to wipe the hard drive, okay? And this is when everything sort of changed because it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why is he trying to wipe the hard drive? Now, some people said, well, you know, he was gonna retire in a few months, which is true. He was retiring in a few months and he had all these plans. He was gonna enjoy life. And so some people were like, oh, he wiped the hard drive because he was retiring. So he had to like clean up the laptop to give it back. And it's like, I'm pretty sure they have protocols on how to do that. There's been a lot of district attorneys that give back equipment. I don't think he needed to drive to another town like pull out the hard drive, like destroy it, throw it in the river, like, no, come on. And then other people were like, what, 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 what's Patty's role in all of this? Because there was another thing that happened that made people speculate about Patty. Ray, I love you very much and I miss you. I want for you to come home. Please call us. We will wait for as long as we need to. And the family members stood there and said, please come back, Ray. That struck me as, why didn't they say, whoever has Ray, let him go. And so they were like, it seems like she's telling him to come home, like that she knows that he left willingly and can return willingly. So this is when people started thinking, oh, did he like fake his disappearance and run away because of something? Also, on his desk at his job, like at the courthouse, he had left this code book on his desk that was open to a page that talked about what happens when the DA could no longer serve. The conspiracy theories were going crazy. They're like, is he trying to leave us signs, hints? Like, what is going on? Then, and I found this in one article, but I read other articles where other people didn't talk about it, so I'm not sure, but I read this thing where they said that apparently he had purchased a book on how to disappear. 
But again, take that with a grain of salt. I'm not 100% sure. So because there was all this speculation about Patty, the girlfriend, knowing about it, she ends up taking a polygraph as well as his daughter, Laura. They both took a polygraph and they passed. Speaking of search history, there was something else that was weird. Now, this was on Ray's work computer. He had searched on MapQuest the directions from where he lived, Belafonte, like that town, to Lewisburg, where his car and stuff were found. But the thing is, he went like from Belafonte to Lewisburg often, and he knew the way. He didn't need directions. So that fueled speculation that was he like getting these directions for someone else to meet someone else who was also in Belafonte and was going to Lewisburg. I don't know. You want it to get even weirder? It's gonna. Turns out, okay, that Bray's brother had something very, very, very similar happen, like almost identical. Ray's older brother, right around the time of his retirement, told his wife that he was going to buy mulch and then he never came home. And then his car was also found abandoned, abandoned, sorry, near a river. Okay, literally like identical, right? The only difference between what happened between Ray and his brother was that his brother's body was found. Till this day, Ray has never been found. And his brother's body was found in the river. And his brother apparently struggled with depression and all this kind of stuff. And so they ruled his death a suicide. Which, by the way, th this thing that I'm talking about that happened to his brother was in 1996. And so when it came out that literally almost 10 years later, almost the same exact thing happened. This is when people started saying, wait a minute, did he do this to himself? But then people came out who knew Ray and they said, actually, Ray never believed his brother took his own life. And he was still looking into it and trying to figure out what happened to his brother. And he always said that his brother would never do that. And he doesn't think that that's what happened. So it's like, what? It's so confusing. So at this point, there are three main theories. Either he took his own life, he faked this whole thing to look like something happened to him and he disappeared and he's starting his life new, or he's in the witness protection program. Or the third theory is foul play. Because remember, he is a prosecutor and his specialty was actually like murder, R word, like violent crime, drug things. Like he was going after dangerous people who would be very upset if he put them in prison for a very, very long time. So people were like, what if it is something to do with a case that he was working on and they're trying to retaliate because about a month or so before this happened where he disappeared, they had announced that they were working on this really big sort of drug trafficking case and that it was the biggest one in the area and could someone connected to that or something, or another case, could this be revenge for what he did as a prosecutor? The foul play theory started to gain more traction when it was revealed in 2011 that Ray Gricar had a connection to the Sandusky case. Now, if you don't know, Jerry Sandusky is a nasty, nasty man. Sandusky basically essayed a crazy number, like I think over 50 children when he was uh, assistant coach of the Penn State football team. And it was this crazy case because he had this other second mile. I think that he had this program where he would deal with like high schoolers and he would use that to, to prey on them. But the worst part about it is that like it was so many people. It was so disgusting what he did. And then on top of that, it was like people knew and they covered it up and it was just awful. In 2011, it was revealed that all the way back in 1998, Ray Gricar, when he was the prosecutor, was brought a complaint from one of these victims' mom telling him about Sandusky and that he refused to prosecute Sandusky. Now, we don't know why. And we don't know if this factors into it, because if you look at the timeline, right, 1998, he knew about what Sandusky was doing. This declines to prosecute. 2005, he vanishes. 2011 is when the Sandusky thing explodes and 
you know, he has his trial, he's found guilty, he's he's in prison now, and it comes out. So people started thinking, could this be connected? Dr. Cyril Wecht says there is a definite link between the Penn State scandal and Ray Grecar's disappearance. Grecar decided not to prosecute Jerry Sandusky and did not convene a grand jury. Grecar may have gotten wind of other allegations against Sandusky that surfaced in the years of Grecar's term. Did someone go after him for revenge because he wouldn't prosecute? Did it have some, did he have something to do with the cover up they were saying and, and that's how he got involved? Did he know the story? Maybe it seemed like the story was blowing up and he wanted to vanish. I don't know. There's a lot of people who talk about the Sandusky connection, as it's called, and a lot of people who debunk it. But, you know, I'm going to bring it to you because it's a fact. It happened. Another thing happened in 2011 as well. Ray Gricar was declared legally dead because his daughter, Lara, she filed a petition asking for her father to be declared legally dead. And the reason for that, she said, was um, they wanted to be able to handle his estate, essentially, basically, get closure and, and declare him dead, and then they can sort of get the inheritance and the money and all that kind of stuff. Apparently had 100000 or something pension and some potentially other assets. Pennsylvania law states that if someone's been missing for seven years, you can have them declared legally dead. And also a judge can do that sooner if the facts merit. Uh, and in this particular case, it was six years after he went missing that his daughter petitioned. And so it was a year early. The day after she petitions to have Ray declared legally dead, Another crazy thing happens. This guy in Utah gets arrested for trespassing and refuses to give his name to police when he gets arrested. And when his picture is taken and this is publicized, a lot of people said that that looks like Ray Gricard and that this is him. It was this whole thing where people were like, the wrinkles, like his fe his features, he was also the same height and weight and age as Ray. It becomes this whole drama while they're trying to verify who this guy is. Turns out it's not Ray Gricar, according to police. They did fingerprints, they had family come in, and it was this other guy, what was his name, something, Bevers? His name was actually Philip Todd Bevers. Because all this drama was happening, the judge didn't rule on whether Ray should be declared legally dead because he could be this guy in Utah. But when police came out and said, no, this is not Ray Gricard, the judge then approved it. And so technically, even though we don't know where Ray Gricard is, he is declared legally dead. And it's interesting because over the years, there have been so many sightings of Ray Gricard. People said they saw him at an Oprah Winfrey taping in Chicago. People said they saw him in, in like so many different cities and states and things. And the police, they say they follow up on it and that it's not true. They don't know where he is. I need to give you guys the backstory and also the odd behavior that people said Ray was exhibiting in the period before he went missing, like the weeks and months before he went missing, people said he was acting strange. It's two days before he disappeared on a Friday, if you recall. Ray was very conservative and he didn't wear his feelings on his chest, but he was in an unusually good mood. They point to a meeting Ray Grecar was at the day before he disappeared. They say when he was asked questions, he just mumbled some answers, just sat there and stared out the window during the whole meeting. Or as one person who was there said, in his mind, it already looked like Ray Grecar was gone. One person who worked with him said that he had also lost a lot of weight and that there was this weird incident where usually he has a schedule book and he's on top of everything um, and they're in court and they're trying to set a trial date and the judge is asking you know is this date good and Ray just blurts out it won't work but he doesn't explain why he doesn't even look at the judge which isn't typical she says he was just staring at the bookcase and he didn't even have a schedule book with him which they thought was odd other people say he, he kind of seemed confused and the thing is though, also when you read interviews with people who knew him and worked with him, they all said that he was for years, he, for decades he's been a DA. And they said that he was always 
quote, aloof and zoned out and kind of wouldn't really look at people. So I'll read you a quote. This person says, he was aloof. He's not the kind of guy I would sit down to have a cold one with. He was known to pass coworkers in the hall without acknowledgement, his eyes set on some unseen goalpost in the middle distance unless they initiated conversation. Remember, he was about to retire. Just a few months after he went missing, he was supposed to turn 60, and retire. And everyone said he was really excited about it. When they asked him, why are you retiring? He said, quote, I'm tired. I want to enjoy life before I'm too old. 35 years is long enough. He said he wanted to go visit his daughter, Laura, in Washington. He wanted to go to national parks. He wanted to do more antiquing and just do the things that brought him joy in life. And so this is why people say it doesn't make sense that he willingly left or he ended his life because he was just about to quote start having fun and enjoying his life and he was looking forward to it and the people who think whether he was checked out or not they think he was he was more checked out because he wanted to retire and start having fun he didn't care anymore remember like he worked this dangerous job people were out to get him 35 years he was a prosecutor putting away murderers you know people who did the worst of the worst crimes and he was known for being relentless and getting really hefty sentences so there's a lot of people that don't like him and that are willing to do things such as murder now i want to talk about suspects because over the years several suspects have come up and the first one i want to talk about is the former hell's angel this person was in prison and they claimed that they had a cellmate who essentially confessed to killing Ray. This cellmate was in prison because of Ray, right? Ray was the prosecutor that put this guy in prison and he was mad about it. This guy said that they took him to this uh, plot of land outside of Lewisburg and they like chopped him up and did all this stuff and buried him. This Hells Angel said that they used a woman to lure him to another area and then that this woman told Ray that she had some information on that drug case that he was working on and that she ends up luring him to the area where the guy who killed him was and that this person killed him and that they put him down a mine shaft. This Hell's Angel inmate who got this information claimed he knew this location, that the person who told him he did it gave him the location. So they end up going there with the authorities and they get to it, it's a big area. When they ask him to point out where Ray's body is, he refuses unless they give him immunity. And turns out they didn't give him immunity and it didn't really go anywhere. And that sort of went away and nothing came of it. But a lot of people wonder if that's precisely what happened. So remember how I told you that like about a month before Ray went missing, he announced that they were working on this huge drug bust. Well, the main guy who was part of that drug ring who did actually get arrested and tried and he's serving like minimum 30 years right now, they thought he could have been involved, but they looked into it and him and his associates and their locations and it didn't seem like any of them were involved. And then there was another suspect. This was a uh, domestic violence case where the perpetrator openly and publicly threatened Ray that he was going to do something to him. And so people said, hey, this guy said he was going to do something to him. Let's look into it. But they checked and he was not in the area at the time when this happened. And so they think he couldn't have done it. By 2014, the cops basically have no leads. And it was the Belafonte police that were handling this case. This is what people talk about. They say that this is a very small and very controversial. Like they have weird drama and things that happen there where like a lot of them now, like one drives an Uber, one detective like works at a hardware store. They're like fighting with each other. It's really crazy. But they were a very small police department. And this type of case required a lot of resources and so much stuff that they really couldn't handle. And a lot of people wondered, why did they get the case when he his car and everything was found in Lewisburg, but apparently because he lived in Belafonte, I guess they gave them the case. It, the whole thing is strange, 
But some people think that that's kind of why nothing's been solved is because they really couldn't handle the case. So in 2014, they actually give the case to the state police and it becomes a cold case because they really weren't doing anything. The thing is, there are a lot of high profile people, former district attorneys and such like this guy, Bob. He believes that it's foul play and that like the case was mishandled and he talks about it. I strongly believe that Ray Gricar was the victim of foul play, that there are Several people that are still alive who know what happened to Ray Grecar, know how he was lured to Lewisburg. I had a pretty strong sense of, in general, who was responsible. The actual details, no. But specifically who did it, yes. He basically thinks that there's no way Ray would have left everything behind and there's no way he would have done this to himself that someone did this to him and he believes this sort of hell's angel theory thing and he he really wishes that they would have worked out some sort of deal to at least verify for sure if this really happened or not um but unfortunately we don't have an answer to that those are the facts now i want to talk about the theories now i do not have with me my tinfoil hat but i stole it a prop one from my monkey. I'm gonna sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me. I can't even see it in the, the full shot. <laughs> but for today's purposes, this is happening right now. Um, there are three main theories, right? Self-harm, foul play, he disappeared and vanished. So let's start with he did this to himself. One of the big, big things that people talk about is that weird coincidence with his brother, how his brother, the same thing happened. They were both around retirement time. Both of them told the women in their lives, they're going somewhere, they'll be back, never came back. Both of their cars found abandoned, both near a river. And the only difference is that the brother was found and Ray wasn't found. So like, what are the odds? What are the odds? And then that's when people say, mm, Maybe he staged it, knowing that that's how it would look, so that they would think he just ended his life and they just can't find the body because the way the river is, you know, it's very easy for his body to just disappear or get, excuse me, like, you know, cut up or whatever. Like, apparently it's a very dangerous river. And so there's, it, w it wouldn't be surprising if they, they didn't find his remains. So people are saying maybe he made it look like that knowing what people knew about his brother and that they would come to the same conclusion so that he could disappear. Which brings me to the disappear theory. The search history, how to fry a hard drive, how to do, why would you need to do that? There, there must have been something he was running away from. But also if he was checked out from his life, right, with work, if he was got that book that said how to disappear, because they also talk about this other guy who he knew about, who was a police chief, who also faked his disappearance in a very similar way, where he left the car and everything. And the only way they found out that he, because they thought he had ended his life, but then there was like a typewriter thing that he wrote these notes on. And they were able to find a little strip, like they were able to trace the typewriter and find that this guy had sort of had a plan to be thousands of mile away, miles away before anyone found stuff so you could get a head start. And then the official theory became that this officer faked his disappearance. And so people are saying that, you know, maybe he took a page out of this guy's book because he would have known about it. It happened around the same time that he was DA. And so, is that what he did? But why? If he was really excited, if he was really happy to retire and he wanted to see his daughter and he wanted to like enjoy life and do all this stuff, why would he feel like he had to escape and start over? And that brings the witness protection program theory. And that's the one that I kind of believe, which I know sounds crazy, but like the witness protection program theory makes sense if you really think about it, because there would be a reason for him to be in the witness protection program and want to cover up something in his hard drive if he had witnessed something or had some weird information and needed protection. 
then he would also need to make it look like this happened to him. The police are trying to push so hard the um, foul play theory, but the walkaway theory, they really try to shut it down. Eddie, is there any discussion that Greek car may have wanted to vanish or possibly do harm to himself? Investigators tell me now and back then that both of those scenarios have been examined fully and they simply did not pan out. There's no evidence pointing in those directions. If he was under witness protection, there would have been some big case that everyone would have known about. There's no indication that he was put under witness protection. If he truly was in the witness protection program, it would not be good for people to think he walked away and was still alive. It would be better for people to think he died because anyone who was trying to get him wouldn't need to get him anymore if they thought he was dead. So that's one thing. The foul play theory is another big one that's also very plausible, like I said, given his job. You've got that weird Hell's Angel uh, story where he was trying to get immunity. Maybe he was afraid something would come back to him and he didn't want to be involved and they thought he was bullshitting. And so they said, no, we're not, we're not doing this. Did he have information? And it didn't have to be him. It could be many of the other people that he put in prison for a very long time that already were killers. Why wouldn't they want to kill him? Or it could be a family member of one of those people, or it could be an associate of one of those people, or it could be maybe what the Sandusky connection that people talk about, what someone's parent who was mad at him or one of the victims themselves or what, who, who would be the one to do this to him in the Sandusky connection? I don't know. It's just so weird. The, the, the pieces that, that mess with me the most are the hard, hard drive, him trying to hide and wipe the hard drive. What was on the hard drive? And then the thing about him being like checked out and stuff, like let's say he really was behaving differently and he was checked out and all of that. If that was the case, either he's going to end his life and so he doesn't care because they always say when people are going to end their lives, they mentally check out. Or he knew he was going to end this life as he knew it and so he didn't care. It fits both theories that that behavior, but if you're going to kill yourself and you, unless you really cared about your legacy, why bother wiping the hard drive? Unless maybe it could implicate someone else you cared about. <sighs> I can keep going. I can keep spiraling. I can keep, I, I, it won't end. Anyway, I would love to know what you guys think. Please tell me what you guys think. Let me know. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you to Factor for supporting my channel. And I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.